Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. My name is Peter Schrappen. I am the co-host for this evening's presentation of Seattle Boat Show Live. And there is my esteemed co-host himself, Mark Bunzel in the house. How are you, Mark? Great, Peter. What a change. We are now in winter boating season. And uh, you know, when I watch our opener and you see people out on the water and the sun shining and I'm, I'm longing for those days. We only have what, a, a, just a little bit longer till December 21st and then we're on the other side. Yeah, you're gonna be changing that clock this weekend, right, Mark? You bet, you Testing bet. Testing this fire alarm, uh, fire alarm to 2 a.m., I think. Yep. Why do I have to test my fire alarm batteries at 2 a.m.? I never quite understood that, but those are those silly rules. Yeah, that's so, so you don't forget. There you go. Well, what's on store for this evening's show, big, a big show tonight, Mark? Well, we've got the Landons are going to be joining us any moment now. We don't have a lot of updates to talk about, uh, 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 but uh, I'll leave that for them in a second. There they are. And uh, we also have Doug Miller from Miltech back with us again. And Doug was here a couple of weeks ago to talk to us about AIS. And we were talking then pretty much about baby AIS or the basic AIS. And we're gonna talk about tonight about this fusion of this new product that's come out that uh, really is pretty remarkable. And I'll just tease it to there and stop. And, uh, uh, but uh, Peter, what's been, you You traveled a little bit today, right? Yeah, well, yesterday I got in the car and got on the ferry and hopped over to Port Angeles to meet with Senator Vandewig and Representatives Theringer and Chapman. All three have been tremendous on recreational boating and fishing issues. And just not by chance, but uh, it was important that there were seven big vessels in town. Uh, we call super yachts that are usually over 120 feet. So we had a chance to, uh, give them a tour. And I think they say a picture is worth a thousand words. So if I can show you if this photo takes out. So that's uh, Marty Marchand of Westport and Representative Chapman looking at uh, the new Westport that's going to be splashed in the next couple of weeks. And then uh, we also met with uh, Senator uh, Vandewake earlier in the day. And we talked similarly about what we like to say boating means business, Mark. You've heard that expression. It's an $8 billion industry. You and bet. The crazy little thing that we're working on, if Mark, if you and I were going to charter a skippered boat, which sounds like a lot of fun, and the crew were, were provided, we'd have to pay taxes on the entire value of the vessel. So a $55 million Westport would mean a $5 million tax bill just to take it on a two-week vacation. So even you, Mark, aren't going to be able to afford that. And it's beyond it's beyond my pay grade for the Wagner Guide. Absolutely. That's right. But yep. I, I hear there's I, a new one coming I heard out. about this law, and I, I can't believe it. I'm glad that... The NMTA and you are putting in the time to uh, to change this. It's crazy. Yeah. So what we're gonna do is just have the tax applied to that discrete vacation. So uh, a two week vacation, let's say it runs ten thousand dollars, you would pay about a thousand dollars in taxes, and then the state would recoup uh, that and more by having these boats in town. I talked to our friend Dan Wara today, the Port of Anacortes. They're on board, so I'll be doing the. I'll be uh, on the chicken. Uh, chicken dinner circuit, making the tours around and trying to gain support as we think about the legislative session, which starts on January 11th uh, next year. So, yeah. Hey, Peter, maybe you ought to talk at one of the shows uh, in a segment about some of the issues that'll be coming up in that legislative session. Uh, I think our audience would be really interested in that. I, Through you, I've followed it every year and I'm always kind of amazed, but I, I doubt it. Some of this information gets out to the general public. This will be a remarkable session. It's a long session. That means that they'll be writing their budgets this year, which has a lot of impact on recreational boating. A lot of tax dollars are divvied up and it will be the first time in the history of our state where the legislators will not be in town. So the uh, House of Representatives will be all remote and the Senate is talking about being on the floor, but uh, there will not be a lot. The campus could very well be closed next year in Olympia. So a lot of people will be doing the Zoom thing as they uh, lobby and advocate for their interests. Yeah, quite makes you wonder time. whether they'll have still images up while they're off uh, snoozing or doing something. Oh, else. oh, Mark, stop that. They're public no, servants. I know let's our legislators work very hard for us. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, let's let's do that. Let's make it. Let's make that happen. We can do that in a couple. We got a couple weeks to do it. Yeah, just when you get a chance, shoot me what the best date for that would be based on the opening of the legislative session. Sure. And I have a little update on uh, sailboat racing. So I talked to the governor's office and they are reticent to providing guidelines for sailboat racing. They feel like enough is already out there. And what they're requesting is that for uh, vessels not to have more than 12 people on board. But besides that, uh, 
it can be a free for all out there on the water, of course, uh, safely boating, please, Mark. And uh, but there will be no specific instructions around sailboat racing. Um, it's like as if recreational boating, but it just happens to be a race. So good stuff. Yeah, that is good stuff, and that makes a big difference. Uh, uh, and Lorena's just chafing at the bit because the uh, uh, she has been working on the special additions to the Wagner Guide for 2021. And Lorena, what is the theme? Well, the theme is meeting the challenge. And of course, it's all about uh, boating events and races for both power and sail. So uh, some exciting events uh, coming up for next year. And of course, uh, one of the news items, Point Roberts Race Week will not occur. They're choosing a new location and that uh, press release will be coming out next week, hopefully. Yeah, so we'll just just wanted to add to the theme, you said power and sail and paddle as and well. Paddle. So there are a number of paddle events in there that are featured as part of the theme. Yeah, Peter, make sure the, uh, the state stays away from the paddling events also. You know, they did issue some guidelines on that. I don't have those on the tip of my tongue, but I will look those up for next week. That's a tease for next week, so stay tuned. Yeah, yeah. Well, why don't we go on while we have the Landons? Uh, what, else, what else is new and different? Well, there we have a couple updates that are of interest. Classic Marine Store in Cowichan Bay in BC, uh, as you may know, uh, they have had in the past mooring buoys that transient boaters could tie up to and pay for overnight stays, and those no longer will be available. They're selling those buoys, so take note of that. And of course, there there's the Fisherman's Wharf and a couple of marinas in Cowichan. And Genoa Bay is nearby, so you still have plenty of moorage options. And, but and, and, and don't forget the a classic marine, the marine store in Cowichan will, is still there and it is open, still has marine supplies. Great, great shop to visit. And so that's one of many updates that are in the 2021 Wagoner Guide. The, and the shoulder season continues here, so boaters are still out there. Uh, we're getting word from the marinas and we're seeing it ourselves right out right outside here in Anacortes. You can still see boats out there and they're they're uh, anchoring out. And uh, just one of the things to uh, we had somebody that brought it to our attention that's down at Lake Island right now. Uh, and that is that uh, at the at the state state parks, uh, all of the moorage, which is the docks and as well as the buoys, have a three night stay uh, limit on it. So it used to be a little higher than that. A number of years ago that uh, it's three nights continuous stay on the docks and also in the buoys and that's all of the marine parks right now so just a reminder on that one and uh what else did we have that's it Shoulder, that's, well, shoulder other, cruising. Yeah. other than that the other you'll have to read the 2021 wagoner guide oh smooth letter or, or all of the most recent updates, which by the way, just went, the big news is that- <laughs> Yeah, what do you got? Uh, more than half of the chapters went off to the printer. They're on their way floating through the, uh, the, uh, the wires or the uh, fiber optics uh, headed off to the printer right now. That's why we're smiling right yes. now. <laughs> well, the rest of the chapters will be uploaded on the Sunday and we have some time to look at the proofs, make any replacement pages and then the presses will roll, so that's coming up. Where do they get printed? Canada. Canada. Winnipeg. Oh, okay. So Canada. we uh, we were printing in Portland and uh, we made a switch this year for a variety of reasons. And uh, the books, uh, both Ports and Passes and the Wagner Guide will be printed in the same plant uh, together and delivered together and they'll be uh, coming from Canada. How many Wagner guides are printed? Uh, this year we'll be doing 6,500. 6,500, very good. And Leonard and Marina sign every single one. Oh. <laughs> oh <I'm Mark. laughs> you guys need to get one of those signature machines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's quite an accomplishment to get it done. And this year, 528 pages and uh, a tremendous amount of new material. I think anybody looking at it will see all the the enhancements that we've made to it. And I'll stop there. That we'll, we'll have a later show and talk about some of the things we learned uh, putting that together. Uh, I just wanted to add one more thing on the updates only because it comes up so darn often. And that's the status of the Canadian border. And once again, the discussion going on uh, in Canada is uh, the, their numbers are going up 
primarily uh, towards the East Coast. And uh, uh, BC is holding its own, not, not too bad. But uh, uh, the Prime Minister is still saying, uh, not anytime soon. So uh, we have no idea when that border is going to open. And it's not even clear it's going to be open next summer. I hate to throw it out that way. And, but uh, we're, we're going to continue to keep an eye on it. And we'll continue to report on it. Well, thank God there's a lot of great boating in our neck of the woods. Yes, yes. And uh, uh, we, uh, everybody is, seems to be enjoying that. So uh, I, I'm, I'm uh, starting to prepare my plan A and my plan B for next season. And, and possibility uh, of flotillas, right? What's that? Possibility, possibility of flotillas go uh, pass through to Southeast Alaska, so. Yeah, we're working out, out the, the details for that to uh, work with the Canadian authorities to potentially do a pass through trip to catch a can and then 10 days cruising in Southeast Alaska. So uh, we'll, we'll come back about flotillas and uh, we'll talk about all the different flotillas that are uh, potentially going up. There's about four different companies uh, in addition to the Wagner Guide that offers flotillas and we'll get the information as to whether they're going to be doing it next season or not. But uh, right now our plan is a plan A and a plan B. And plan B will be what if the border is not open and we plan on putting together a great trip that people can go on uh, in the States. So. And just a reminder too on the updates that you were talking about that just that uh, at the wagonerguide.com website, the COVID, what was the COVID-19 table uh, will be out there as the updates table. So it's, uh, it's now uh, transitioning into that uh, new, new form that's planned for next year. So we can carry the most recent information about the border, as well as marinas, about flotillas, about uh, communities. All of that information will be out there on the, on the updates table now. So wagonerguide.com forward slash updates. A great name. It only took us about four meetings to come up with the name. <laughs> four anyway, well, uh, yeah, you, you, are we going to tell them about some of the uh, the rejected, the ones that no, sounded no. great don't, at don't first? Don't and, okay, future episode, Leonard. Yes, yeah. <laughs> sweeps week. We'll do that. That's up there week. with the bloopers reel. <laughs> that was the bloopers. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, why don't place. we go on to our our main event and. Uh, Doug Miller, why don't you join us? I know you're out there because we saw, there you are. Welcome, hey, Doug. everyone. And you're in Port Orchard tonight? I am, yes. Fantastic. All right. And has it started to ice up on the water down there yet? No, no, but um, according to my cortex, the, the water temperature at my boat is 48 degrees right at the moment, so. 48 degrees at your boat. And yeah. Leonard, Seeing you're using the Cortex also, what's the temperature at your boat? I, my, I did not hook up the water temperature sensor ah, okay. uh, on the Cortex, but I can tell you exactly what the voltage is and I can tell you a number of other things on the boat and it's fantastic. All right, so this Cortex that we've been teasing about and talking about, uh, the reason why we're dedicating a show to this is because yes, it's a good product, great product from a good company, but it, it could be the beginning of a movement. And, and I think what we're seeing is more and more of this integration of computer power together with some of the things that are available on the boat. And uh, uh, Vesper, the company that makes this, uh, well known for doing a, a, a fantastic AIS unit, uh, they are, are really sticking their necks out on this. And Doug, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you explain exactly what a Cortex unit is. Okay. Well, maybe I'll start two years ago, a little more than two years ago at Metz. And uh, I went to visit the Vesper folks there. And they said, okay, we have this private briefing for you. We want to tell you about this exciting new product. This is two years ago. And uh, so we go into this little secret room. And so we all sat down there looking very serious. And I said, you're not going to build an AIS transponder combined with the radio, right? Right. And everybody looked kind of taken aback. And, and in fact, that's what they've been doing. And over the last couple of years, it's been a, a long, hard road to 
build this very unique new product that is not just an AIS transponder, state-of-the-art transponder with the latest bells and whistles, but it's also a VHF radio and it also does remote vessel monitoring. And so there's nothing else like this in the market. Nobody else has ever tried this. And one of the hardest parts of doing this is getting all the certifications. And uh, for about the last year, they've been working on doing that and it finally came out of certification. Uh, gee, I guess uh, about four months ago. And now it's on the market. So it's a very exciting new product. And it's so exciting that uh, Leonard Lorena put a unit on their boat. Uh, my, a unit went on, I put it on my boat a couple of days ago. Uh, I didn't, I had some very qualified uh, uh, technicians do it, although uh, it's not that difficult to do. And so we have this fusion that you're describing of AIS and VHF. Why, why do I care about those two? We'll hold the vessel monitoring off a little bit because that, that as a standalone, you kind of understand that. But why, and, and what were the benefits to DSC? And uh... so one of the uh, things that actually Standard Horizon did a few years ago is they had an AIS radio that also was a full DSC capable radio. And the idea that you could select a target and then hit a call button and initiate a DSC, digital selective calling, uh, call directly to that target if you wanted to discuss how to pass and that sort of thing. And it was a pretty cool feature and people liked it, but you know it was a little hard to use and you, you weren't necessarily sure you were talking to the right person all the time. Um, so Vesper have gone you know, completely beyond that sort of initial concept and the idea that you can see um, a vessel in front of you on the on this handset, and I'll show you some slides in a in a sec here that visually will show you what we're talking about. But you you'd be able to see a target and know that it's an AIS target and how how soon you're going to pass and that sort of thing. But now you can just hit a button and call them directly on the same interface device, which is this handset sort of thing that you know looks like a almost like a phone and it's lit up and you can see the target and push you know, a call button just like you would on a, a regular radio and initiate a DSC call. So finally, somebody has a, a product that'll allow the, the, everyone to be able to participate in DSC and be able to do it simply. So prior to this, the way you would make a DSC call, uh, for those who've not tried to do this, is you would have to manually put in the numbers, the MMSI number, uh, and it's what, nine digits. And it was right. really kind of a pain to put it in. So not many people used it. Yeah, and it's exactly. It's a great capability that's been on the radios now for almost 17 years, and yet people wouldn't use it because yep. it was so difficult. And just to explain what, what DSC is for folks who aren't familiar, it's the idea that you can you know, use this special number, the MMSI number on the radio and initiate a call to another vessel if you know what their MMSI is, sort of like a phone number if you like. And what happens is their radio will ring like a telephone and only their radio will ring. And so they can acknowledge that and it'll automatically uh, switch channels to the, the channel that the caller has selected and then they can carry on a radio conversation. Uh, it's not a private radio conversation, but the hailing part of it is, is private. And instead of, is really nice for buddy boats if you're on a long, long trip, instead of always hailing, hey, blue dog, this is Red Tango on 16 all day long, you can use DSC and initiate this private hail to another boat and be able to, to talk on, on the regular working channels. Uh, I can't wait to use this for my flotillas because you can set it up for a group and hit one button and alert everybody that you've got an announcement. But I had a situation in Prince William Sound, Alaska, a couple of years ago with an Alaska ferry uh, coming towards me off in the distance. And I was uh, co-captaining a, a Nordhaven 40. And I looked at him and I thought, okay, I'm going to start to veer off just slightly to let him know that I want to pass him and I plan to pass him port to port. Well, 
I watched him. I, I turned slightly to starboard to go past port to port. And then he turned towards me. Then I turned away. Then he turned. And we did this dance back and forth. And I finally got on the radio on VHF 13, bridge to bridge frequency. And I said, Captain, I'm, you know, the other, uh, I'd like to pass you port to port if that's all right with you. And uh, he laughed and chuckled. He said, yeah, I was wondering uh, when we were gonna get this sorted out. And, and now with this, uh, we wouldn't have to do that. We could basically uh, just touch the button, the little uh, uh, alarm would go off that I'm calling him and we could have a direct conversation. And uh, I, I, this is where I'm looking forward to it. I don't know how many of you have, have dealt with uh, a Washington State Ferry or a BC Ferry. And I always hear the question, what, what channel are they monitoring? Are they monitoring 16? And no, they're not. Uh, but by law, they do have to monitor channel 13 and often they're on the VTS frequency. So this will be a way of coordinating ourselves with traffic, as well as what other collision avoidance features does it have, Doug? Well, maybe this would be a good time to jump in and show you a couple of slides that sort of summarize this and then show you some visuals that, that I think will sort of bring the whole idea home. So uh, if that's okay, I'll switch, uh, take over the screen here and... Um, so can everybody see that yeah we Good. do thank you okay so uh basically this is a, a snapshot of the the vesper uh head unit in the middle or hub as they call it um, one of the handsets that's used. And then they have a couple of apps that can be used on uh, iOS and Android devices that interface with this system as well. And basically everybody, all of these devices are interfaced through Wi-Fi when you're on board the boat. And then I'll talk about sort of an alternate solution that they have as well for when you're away from the boat. So really um, this system starts with uh, what they call smart AIS. It's a traditional uh, class B SOTDMA five watt AIS transponder with an integrated splitter. So, so far nothing too special because there's lots of vendors out there selling AIS and, um, and it's almost, you know, you, you could almost consider it sort of a commodity item available from just about any manufacturer. They also add GPS, they have a built-in heading sensor, uh, they have Wi-Fi on board so you can connect apps to the, the device. And then, of course, support the standards NEMA 2000 and NEMA 183 for interfacing with other instruments on board. So, so far, so good. You can use this to send your position to everybody else. And then you can also use it to send other vessel information to your chart plotter or your computer or your um, tablet. And, um, and so far, that, that part is, is sort of traditional AIS with a few extra bells and whistles. So Doug, Next this, is, is a, this is a way though within this device that I can get that signal, that AIS information onto my iPad. If I'm exactly. using avionics, this is a way I can get that data on there. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. And that's very similar to their previous products, the uh, uh, XB8000, which is still a huge big seller, just won a big NEMA award. And um, the idea is that it'll stream AIS and GPS data to a connected tablet, and then you can fire up your favorite app like uh, iNavX or Navionics or Time Zero, and be able to see AIS targets in real time overlaid on, on the charts on those uh, various apps. That's fantastic. So, and as I understand it, that's sending a Wi-Fi signal out from the Cortex unit around the boat to your various devices that can pick up a Wi-Fi signal. That's correct, exactly, yeah. So my iPhone or, or other uh, smartphone device, I can then pull that information in and, and uh, Vesper actually has apps to do that. Exactly, and, and in fact, they've gone a, a bit further than just displaying AIS and I'll, I'll talk about that in a sec, but they have things like Anchor Watch and that sort of thing. 
So the next uh, major component is the VHF radio. And, and basically this is a, a standard class D DSE 25 watt VHF transceiver. Um, it allows you to share the single antenna, but the, the main difference here is this handset. It's very unique. Um, and that is basically your interface to the radio. You can uh, use that to call, to do an emergency broadcast, whatever you need to do. But instead of having you know, the traditional wired mic uh, system that you, you've seen in the past, this has a full color display that goes well beyond just making VHF radio calls. And then um, we'll talk a little bit about the, the third major feature, which is onboard and remote vessel monitoring. And this is probably one of the coolest uh, new features. And basically what this does is allow you from home to be able to uh, essentially dial into your boat and be able to see um, the systems on your boat. Uh, if you have the anchor watch set, you can see if your boat drifts and that sort of thing. And so I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. One of the cool things with that is you can hook it up to these sensors to be able to monitor different um, things going on on the boat. For example, on my own boat, I have one uh, hooked up to my bilge. Uh, to see if the, the water rises beyond a certain level, as well as the bilge pump. And I'll, I'll tell you a kind of a fun story of literally how Cortex saved my boat a couple of weekends ago when I was out cruising. So it's um, amazing. It's got all this different communications capability, uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, uh, I think it also has Bluetooth to talk to the handsets. Uh, actually, it uses uh, Wi-Fi on the handsets, yeah. And then uh, following your slides there, it actually has a cellular transmitter built in within it. Is that correct? That's right. It's got a cellular modem uh, with its own SIM card, and it will connect to service in the US and Canada with the, uh, the US Canadian version. And um, we'll basically connect and, and stream information uh, from the transponder and your vessel and the systems on, on the vessel uh, to the Vesper cloud, and then you can use their app to be able to view that information uh, and even take action. You can uh, set up relays to maybe turn on a light um, or, or something else like that. If you forgot to turn on your anchor light, maybe you'd have a, a relay set up for that. You'd be able to turn it on and off. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say one of the things that impressed me is the quality of the handset. Uh, it it it's Gorilla Glass like my iPhone. It it's uh, uh, small. The the buttons are, are are good on it. The screen and I was impressed that the screen works even when your fingers are wet. My iPhone won't work. Uh, screen won't right. work when my fingers are wet. So I don't know what they did differently, but I love it. Yeah, no, a lot of work went into the design to make it a, a real world uh, solution in for real boaters. I mean, if you're out in the rain or you get hit by a wave or whatever, it's fully waterproof. Um, you're not gonna uh, destroy the thing by getting it wet and it's ruggedized as well. So you can have up to 10 of these devices uh, connected to the Cortex. Um, so you could have 10 radio um, stations essentially hooked up to the single unit and that can be either wired units or wireless but it's important to note that uh, regardless of whether it's wired or wireless these are speaking or communicating with uh, the cortex using wi-fi technology so there's there's no physical wires between the handset and the cortex everything is wireless so i can and be I, in the galley things i noticed on the uh, the vhf has a number of features on it very what you would think of as small features but some memory on the uh, on some of the uh, for instance channel 16 if i set it to low power and i go off channel and back to 16 it still remembers that I, that i wanted it on low power you can put memory uh, channels in there that you want to go to if you want if you need to uh, it just made vhf a whole lot more usable uh, not to mention the dsc calling capability you were talking about uh, or mark was talking about the difficulty of using DSC on older radios. And I still remember uh, we were trying to call a friend with DSC uh, up here locally. And by, time I, by the time I got the MMSI number in and figured out how to enter it and do that, he was out of range. 
<laughs> never forget that one. Yeah, and unfortunately, most people, when they get a DSC call, they have no idea what to do next. You know, their radio starts ringing like a telephone, and they've never heard it do that before. And it was like, what happened? Am I sinking? What's going on? So it'll take a little education to get people used to it. But this is a great first step, because if you can use a, a smartphone, you can use one of these. This is sort of how I think of it. Absolutely. Um, I just wanted to say after you uh, have a chance to talk about the uh, one of my favorite features and, and by the way we had the uh, the 8000 unit on there before we replaced it with the Cortex and it's the anchor watch so uh, I'll let you introduce that first but that's one of the what I think is one of the better features of the, of the unit. Right. So one of the things with this handset, it goes beyond being just a, a VHF radio. You can also do AIS collision avoidance on it, anchor watch, and a bunch of other things. So it becomes this multi-purpose integrated single display that you can use for doing all sorts of things beyond just talking on the radio. Um, and then finally, um, apps. You can run apps on your iOS or Android device uh, there's two apps that Vesper have produced. There's an onboard app that obviously you would use on board the, the vessel. And again, this can do AIS collision avoidance and anchor watch via Wi-Fi and that sort of thing. So um, a lot of functionality there. And then they have a monitor app that can communicate with the cortex anywhere where there's a, a cellular signal. And uh, that means a cellular signal for the boat in either a cellular or Wi-Fi signal for the uh, phone. And this allows you to view in real time what's going on on the boat. Uh, to give you a, a, an example, I used it the other night and we had that big blow. Uh, it was blowing like crazy where I live on Rich Passage. So I, I wanted to see how, how hard the wind was blowing on the boat at the marina. And so I was able to bring up the app and go and look and see that it was only blowing about 15 knots there. So, you know, no, no cause for alarm. I was also able to see that my battery was still fully charged and I could tell that it was still plugged into the main system. Um, you know, we hadn't lost power there even though other, other places had. So really nice to have that remote capability. And then finally, uh, there's support for using the data coming off of the Cortex system on popular apps. So um, as Mark mentioned, we you know, support Navionics, and Navix, and Time Zero uh, on PCs and Macs with Rosepoint or OpenCPN. Basically, anything that can uh, interface with that Wi-Fi uh, signal that's coming off the Cortex. And don't forget Coastal Explorer in there. That we use that extensively with the 8000 and the Cortex as well. Right. Yeah. That's that's why I mentioned. Uh, Rosepoint, they're, they're actually doing an iPad version for uh, Coastal Explorer, and I'm, I'm not sure yet whether they're still going to call it Coastal Explorer, but yeah, their, their products are uh, interface very well with all of this. And one thing I should mention is, uh, like with the XB8000, uh, this system does uh, multiplexing of any of the data found on the NEMA networks, and then it acts as a gateway and sends that to these connected services and, and devices and apps as well. So if you're using Rosepoint, for example, on a PC connected over Wi-Fi, you'll be able to see wind, depth, temperature, all of that good stuff, all forwarded through the Cortex system over Wi-Fi to the connected device. Now, Doug, you teased us a little bit. You told us it saved your boat. What happened? Well, um, so I'm... Uh, Basically, we, we have a sailboat, and uh, as with most sailboats around here, the wind kind of petered out, so we started the engine, and we're puttering along. And uh, suddenly I get this alert on my smartwatch, and it you know, came up and said uh, the bilge pump had turned on, and that was an alert that came from Cortex. Even though I'm using the remote monitoring capability, it basically still alerted me. And I thought, okay, that's not too unusual, there's some waves and you know, it's probably some water in the bilge and the pump came on. And then it came on again a minute later and I, I think, gee, what's going on here? I didn't hear the bilge pump because my engine's on. And so then it happened again and I thought, okay, some, something's up here. So my wife took over on the helm and I went down below and looked and looked and long and short of it is, um, a hose clamp on my engine had broke and there was water streaming all over the place in the engine room. 
And so we, we shut things down. I was able to um, get a new hose clamp on there. And you know, within a couple of minutes, I was back running again. But when you think about it, most people don't hear their bilge pump uh, when they're motoring. And uh, it just terrifies me to think how long I might have gone before I would have noticed that you know the engine room was filling up with water and the I mean the bilge pump was keeping up but still you don't like to have salt water spraying all over your engine. So. And Leonard you utilize the anchor watch capability which I think is in that middle slide there isn't it Doug? Um, actually there's uh, I'll jump into a, a I think the far right one is the anchor watch. Yes it is you're right. Uh, yeah yeah. Uh, well, yeah, we use it extensively, and I, I, one of the things I've, uh, it keeps a very good uh, breadcrumb trail, the, uh, the XB8000 did, and also the Cortex, and they did a wonderful job on that. A uh, very detailed, very uh, precise breadcrumb trail of the movement of the boat, and the reason it's valuable for me is, I don't know about the rest of you, but I, I, I always remember to set the anchor watch uh, after we've backed down and set the anchor. And then I go, oh yeah, I should have set the anchor watch. And so invariably I set it and, the, and I've not set it where the anchor actually went down. And with the breadcrumb trail, as you move around, it forms this perfect semicircle, or in some cases a perfect circle all the way around. And then just reposition the, the display because uh, you know from that breadcrumb trail that looks like a donut or a crescent shape, you know exactly where the where the anchor is at that time. Set the anchor watch, and it's perfect from there out. I wanted to add one more. Uh, uh, well, or I may be jumping ahead, but this is one of the great features uh, that we uh, I've been looking for, which is the anchor watch, where you can get alarms and also check uh, check it remotely. Uh, and we did that. I don't know if you want to go into that first, Doug, but I can. We have a firsthand story on that. No, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so we that. Uh, Obviously, uh, you can set the anchor watch and then you can get alarms and you can also check the anchor watch uh, remotely from the cell phone because the, uh, the hub unit, the Cortex unit is communicating through the cloud and then through the remote app on the smartphone, uh, you, can, you can check that. And we, um, we had this installed uh, here. Uh, we wanted to get it installed before or while we had time to go out and use it a little bit. And we did, it was in September and we went out to Cypress Island uh, and we put the, uh, the boat was down there. We wanted to hike up to Eagle Cliff, went up on shore and got all the way to top, top of Eagle, Eagle Cliff. And I invariably think that uh, as soon as I'm on the trail or off the boat is when I, when I instinctively say, I'm sure the anchor is slipping somewhere. And so top of Eagle Cliff, I had that, in, that thought, oh my gosh, I bet my boat is moving and uh, the remote anchor watch picked it up, looked at it, sure enough, could see the whole thing. It, it told me uh, the how timely the report was, that uh, the report I was getting was up to three minutes recent and, or about three minutes recent. And it was comforting to know that everything was fine on the boat. Great, yeah. So I have uh, three shots of the handset uh, that you can get with the Cortex system. Uh, the, the far left one is, is doing a, a standard VHF call, but you can also see that we're getting some warnings about a possible collision with a, a vessel at the bottom of the screen. And so we can actually select that with our finger and get more information. Uh, the second screen there, we can see the collision screen uh, and see that we're on a, a collision course with Evening Star. Uh, we can see that we're there 2.2 miles away and we're going to pass within 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.3 uh, nautical miles. Um, and I'll show you in a sec here one of the cool features that, again, is very unique. The idea of, of sort of gaming the system and, and trying to see, okay, if I turn left five degrees, what happens? If I turn right five degrees, does that change uh, the collision vectors? Does it go from being a red active target to just a gray target that I'm going to pass? So we'll, I'll look at that in a sec. And then finally, the, uh, the anchor watch that, that we mentioned. So this is just a, a quick little video off the Vesper site of, of some of these capabilities. The collision avoidance um, is one. And um, so we're getting a warning on our handset that we were on a collision. And here's this little uh, dial that you can turn to go and look and see if you're gonna miss that person. Here's the anchor watch, dropping the anchor 
and oops, we're dragging, oh, we're dragging. We're about to drag outside of our, our 72 meter radius here. Um, and boom, we've got an anchor alarm that uh, is loud and it gets louder and louder. Finally, we also have a, a man overboard capability. So if somebody falls overboard and they have a, a man overboard device, it'll instantly alert the cortex system in the handset. And you have the ability to do as well a DSC man overboard call, emergency call, if necessary, directly by hitting that uh, little green button up on the top right. Um, if you don't have man overboard devices on your life jacket or whatever, you can hit a, a dedicated button on the Cortex handset to, to mark a man overboard event so you know where that happened. And you can initiate a man overboard DSC call from your radio instantly by just uh, simply uh, selecting the, uh, that function. So a lot of possibilities here beyond just talking on the radio. And um, so I wanted to talk just a sec about the, the apps. Um, the first app is the onboard app. And here you can see um, a typical AIS screen. I, I took a screenshot of this one. This is out in front of Seattle and 447 AIS targets. It's insane. They, this was just a couple of weeks ago. People are still out there boating. And, um, and so you can see a couple that are highlighted or filtered to show me that uh, they're uh, coming towards me on a, on a potential collision course. Um, here's a vessel that I selected that's on a, a collision course. It'll actually pass behind me and I can tell that because of this blue line and, and uh, circle here that ultimately this vessel will pass behind me on, on this course. But I wanted to sort of see what would happen if I turned left a bit um, and also if I turned right a bit and see how that changes the profile for the potential collision. And so you can see here, it's gone to a, a gray color, so it's no longer a, a, a potential collision. And then we have the, the famous anchor watch uh, that Leonard talked about with all the, the little breadcrumb trail of where the boat has been. And I also have it hooked up to my depth uh, sensor and my wind sensor, so I can see exactly where the wind's coming from and what my depth is. Um, one of the things that you can do once you get an idea of where your anchor should have been dropped is you can go down uh, to this little uh, second icon here and move your anchor to where you think it should have been. So very handy feature. And then they also have an instrument display, which is really nice. I, uh, I'm thinking of just getting a dedicated tablet just to have an instrument display on my boat, uh, similar to the one that's on the screen here. So that's the, the app that you use when you're on board the boat. And then there's also an app called Monitor, uh, which allows you to have some visibility into the, the functions on the boat uh, when you're away. And this is done again over cellular technology. So um, here you can see on, on my boat, I have it connected to my NEMA 2000 network. So I'm getting water depth, vessel speed, temperature, and that sort of thing, as well as my battery level as well as my bilge uh, high water alarm. So uh, you, you have the ability to set up multiple uh, dedicated extra sensors beyond what, what is on most boats. Um, you can also do the anchor watch, as Leonard said, from uh, a remote location. So let's say you've gone to a restaurant, you've taken the dinghy in, you've anchored out in the harbor, and you wanna make sure that your, your, uh, your vessel hasn't, uh, dragged anchor. And of course, you can also see here the wind direction and we can see the wind speed. So we, we have an idea at least that, you know, things seem to be okay. The alarm hasn't gone off and we can see a, a track over the previous two hours if we want. And we can see, you know, how far away we are from where we dropped the anchor. So all really useful information. And then finally, you can also just see where you are on the chart uh, this is just a map, actually. Um, in this case, we were anchored in Polsbo, and I can see yeah, we're still there in Polsbo. So, hey, so. Doug, on the the um, and this is kind of a question too, because I but it looks like the GPS uh, receives from all the different uh, GPS systems. Is that correct? Well, the the Cortex system has its own GPS, 
Uh, and so that's the authoritative GPS system for, for Cortex. But, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, what I meant was uh, the, G, the, the Cortex GPS receives from all the different satellite systems. Yes, yes, it currently supports all four of the, the standard uh, satellite systems, so it could be used worldwide without any issue. Um, and of course, since it's on the NEMA 2000 network, that can also be your authoritative GPS system for other devices, such as a DSC radio on, on another part of the boat or uh, a chart plotter or whatever. I assume since it's receiving from all, the, all four of the different satellite systems that does, that, that is, uh, improves the accuracy and possibly also the reliability? Uh, yes, I would think so. Yeah, and, and a lot of the manufacturers out there are moving more and more towards uh, going beyond just uh, you know, the traditional US GPS system um, to the other systems in Europe and, and uh, China and Russia. I recently read an article about something about uh, increasing amount of jamming and uh, problems with GPS signal. Uh, not in this part of the world, but in uh, other parts of the world. And do you know, uh, that was an open question to me as to whether uh, receiving all four of the satellite systems might give you a little bit more backup and assurance that you really do have the correct positioning. Yeah, I think that I think that's true. Uh, I haven't heard so much about the, the, you know, the real world issues that people are facing with, with GPS uh, jamming, but um, yeah, certainly right. having multiple systems is, uh, is a great idea. I read an article, apparently there was a, a fair bit of jamming going on somewhere in the Mediterranean area and uh, a little bit further to the, uh, to the Southeast, I guess. <clears throat> Doug, it has a, a direction uh, uh, finder in it. Uh, is uh, that one seemed to be a little bit more accurate than some of the older ones that were part of autopilots and other systems. Uh, have you looked into that at all? Uh, well, it does have its own built-in heading sensor, uh, which is really nice, and you can uh, calibrate it. Um, if you don't calibrate it, it'll kind of self-calibrate itself. Uh, but it does seem very accurate. I've, I've compared it to my own heading sensor on the boat connected to my autopilot, and it seems very accurate. Uh, currently, right now, it's dedicated for the Cortex system and not uh, surfaced out to other devices on the boat. but uh, I think ultimately it may be uh, at some time in the future. Interesting. Yeah. So just uh, real quick, uh, people always ask how much is it? And uh, so I've got the pricing up here, um, you know, starts with the hub and then you can get the hub with a, a wired handset and then you can buy extra handsets um, as you need them and they can be added at any time. And then um, also there's the uh, monitoring system. There's a basic monitoring system that's free uh, and it uh, gives you a couple of daily updates. And then the premium monitoring is the one that gives you the real-time updates and alarms, uh, the remote control capability, the anchor watch, and then geofencing. So you know if, if your boat moves outside of a certain area where you hopefully nobody's gonna take your boat. Um, and you know, it, one of the things that, that a couple of people have said, gee, this is kind of a real premium product. It's quite expensive. But when you look at the, the full capabilities of a five watt SOTDMA uh, AIS transponder with built-in splitter, built-in Wi-Fi, built-in multiplexing, and then you look at the, the radio capabilities, and then you look at the monitoring capabilities, which typically cost you, you know, seven, $800 it's actually a real bargain. Um, and so, you know, I think people will, will gradually sort of get over the sticker shock initially of seeing, you know, that what may seem like a higher price. When you do the math, it's actually, you know, not a bad deal at all. Uh, I had a question on the, the daily, the two daily updates on the basic. Uh, I assume you can set those by time, but it, if all of a sudden you have an alert, either anchor watch or a bilge alarm, does that force an alert to go out and go to your smartphone? Um, I, I, to be honest, I haven't had a chance to try that and I'm not sure exactly where uh, the boundary is between what you'll see in the basic monitoring and what you'll see with uh, the premium monitoring. 
Uh, right now, Vesper are giving away the premium monitoring for three months when you buy the product. Uh, so I haven't had a chance to try out the basic. The other thing I should mention is you can do it month to month. You don't have to buy a full year. Uh, so you could turn it on for the summer cruising season uh, and then go and turn it off at the end of the season if you wanted. Interesting. I'll also point out that uh, uh, the quality of it on the handset is just phenomenal. What impressed me was the quality of the speaker. Uh, I bought a, uh, uh, another brand of VHF radio about a year and a half ago. And I really liked the idea that it was small and compact on my helm till I realized that so was the, sp the speaker. The speaker was small and compact and sounded terrible. And I ended up spending, you know, another 50 bucks to put a accessory speaker in. Right. And One of the nice things with, with the Cortex is you actually have two speakers and potentially three. Um, the hub itself has a speaker, the handsets have speakers, and you can rig up an external speaker. So um, one of the kind of the fun things, if you're on a collision course, it, it'll sort of whisper at you, you're, you know, you're on a collision course, and, and then it gets louder and louder, and then horns start going off and if, if you continue to ignore it. So there's no way to, to miss the warning that you're about to get hit by a Washington State ferry. So. Uh, that, uh, that warning sounds that when it gets to the horn level, it sounds just like a the fog horn on one of the ferries, by the way, <laughs> which is what we mistook it for at first. <laughs> yeah, it definitely gets your attention. Yeah. Oh, it did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, anyway, there's we have lots more info on on our site. Uh, we also uh, I encourage you to go to the Vesper site. I have a couple of articles up in my blog up on, on miltechmarine.com, uh, one on first impressions and then one on the monitoring system and go in, you know, I go into a lot more detail than I did tonight. So um, that um, basically is what I have prepared, but I'm happy to take uh, questions or hand it back to the, the other folks who are using Cortex as well. Yeah, so we can uh, take questions on the chat line if any of you have a question. Uh, we did have, get one response from somebody who was pointing out the location of the uh, 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 the race week, and uh, 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 we didn't know that this has been announced publicly, and and we haven't gotten the press release, so we're avoiding uh, till next week announcing that location. But uh, Liz, thank you for pointing that out for us, and we appreciate that. We have another question that came up approximately how much oh, yeah, Mark. Yeah. I actually got the press release, so it's okay. Oh, there do you, you want to reveal news. it? I need like a drum roll or some sort of fanfare here. Do you, do you do drum rolls, Mark? Uh, sure. So yeah, it's big news. Race Week announces new venue and of course, Washington, Whidbey Island Race Week, the organizing authority um, is moving from Port Roberts Race Week. It's, the dates will be June 21st through 25th. And if I'm yeah. uh, speeding up, I can create a link and put that in the chat. And that'll be at the Cap Sandy Marina. And uh, for those of us who live in Anacortes, we're thrilled at that. That is terrific. Um, Mike uh, uh, shot in a, a question for us. How much power does the Cortex unit consume, say, overnight when you're in anchor watch mode? mode? He's, of course, thinking of his batteries, and I don't blame him. And then besides uh, requiring a VHF antenna connection, does it require any external antenna for GPS, for Wi-Fi, or for cell? Doug, do you want to handle that? Sure. Um, so for the, the power consumption, uh, you know, one of the things you can do, I tried this on, on my own setup, is I actually I, I turned off the handset and used my phone for the anchor watch, but I left on the M1 hub. And so that uh, I could check the status of my anchor on my phone beside the bed and not be consuming extra power by having a powered up um, mic. And that said, you can actually put the mic into night mode and turn down the brightness and that sort of thing. But typically um, these devices are consuming about a third to a half an amp of power, uh, 12 volts. So not a tremendous amount. If you have the, the handset turned all the way up, it'll be a little bit more than that, uh, but certainly a lot less than, for instance, leaving on an anchor alarm on your uh, chart plotter. 
I, I can add to that that on our uh, boat that uh, what's sitting right now uh, in it um, in the uh, in the slip and everything is powered off except for the M1 unit. Of course, the handset is powered off and it's monitoring right now, and that's just about what we're seeing uh, on the amp display that I have on the boat. It shows just a little bit, a little under one amp, and that it may not be completely accurate, but uh, but it's certainly somewhere between a half and a full amp at, at most. And Doug, uh, an add-on question to that is, uh, what uh, antennas do you need to have or do you need to add on this? Or can I use my existing antennas for GPS as well? So great question. Um, the unit itself comes with a GPS antenna, uh, which you, in a variety of different mounts, so you can install it. Uh, either obviously outside the boat or on a rail or whatever. Uh, a lot of people are successful installing the GPS antenna inside the cabin. Just one thing, you know, try to make sure there's no metal directly above it. And um, what I'm finding, and this is sort of new news for me, is GPS antennas don't work very well inside wooden enclosures, wooden boats or inside a, a wooden closet. So keep that in mind. Um, and then you also have a, there's a Wi-Fi antenna that's included. So you can set that up so you get a really good Wi-Fi coverage throughout the whole boat. Uh, there's an optional, um, actually I can hold one up here. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of antenna connectors here. Um, so for the cellular, for GPS, for Wi-Fi. And then uh, we also have uh, connections for our VHF antenna. And uh, oh, you're holding have... up the M1 unit. So that's what the yes. course looks like. Yeah. So that's one side of it. So we got, you know, our VHF connection, GPS, um, and then, uh, sorry, GPS over here and uh, cellular and Wi Fi. Um, this is actually a second port for a second VHF radio. So it's got a built in splitter. Um, but to come back to your question on the VHF antenna, a lot of time, you know, an existing good quality VHF antenna will work just fine for this unit for both AIS and VHF. That said, if you've got uh, an antenna that's really finely tuned with small bandwidth just for VHF radio, it may not work so well for AIS. And uh, if you go to our blog area, I have a, a whole blog article on why the selection of your VHF antenna is probably one of the most important factors for, for getting this all to work well. Um, and so, you know, you really don't need a lot more than, than the Cortex itself, other than power and the antenna, and then you can connect it over NEMA 2000 to a variety of other devices on your boat, like chart plotters. Uh, following uh, some of the other questions, uh, Sue is asking how often the AIS location gets updated. Well, it depends. Uh, with the, uh, the new SOTDMA 5 watt uh, class B, uh, it depends on your speed. If you're just at anchor or in your slip, it's once every three minutes. Uh, and then it increases depending on speed uh, up to, uh, oh gee, I'd have to look it up, uh, the exact seconds. But you know, it's often enough that even a fast vessel, you'll see that vessel moving quickly across a receiving screen. Uh, here's kind of an odd one for you. Uh, how many pages does the owner's manual have? <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually have one, Reed. Here, I didn't know you were going to ask this question. But this I, I is the either. This is from a from a uh, viewer. Yeah. Right, thank you for that question. Yeah. So this is just the the user guide for how to use the handset, and it's really not that complicated. Um, obviously, you have to get it installed, and if you're a little intimidated by installing, you know, get you know, get a, uh, a good NEMA certified installer to help you out. But um, it, once you get the system installed, it's fairly intuitive. And that was a big design goal to, to make it as easy as possible. By the way, I want to do a quick shout out to, uh, I see two Vesper folks are on uh, this broadcast, uh, uh, Jason Young in the, on the East Coast. Uh, who represents Vesper here in the US, and Jeff Robbins, who's uh, one of the founders of Vesper, who's dialed in from New Zealand. So, hi, Jeff. Hi, Jason. All right. We're going international, Mark. Global. Yeah, we're going international. I'll be darned. Thank I'll you. Break the internet. Uh, well, that, uh, Leonard, Lorena, anything else? You've been using it now for almost a, a month, a little over a month. 
Uh, any other insights that you have as a user? Well, the alarms work, that's for sure. It'll tell you if there's if you're <laughs> the, in trouble. <laughs> the collision. It's a great device, and it really is a whole new approach to some areas that have not been approached, mainly the VHF area, but the monitoring is it's all integrated into one box. And uh, I think it was your article, Doug, that stated, uh, or maybe I read it somewhere else, but this is one of those devices on your boat uh, that really works for you when you're out underway and also when the boat is sitting back at the slip or on or wherever you have it stored. So it's working for you the whole time, uh, where, whereas many of the other devices on your boat are working for you when you're underway and separately when you're, when you're off. But this thing is really doing something for you the whole time. I just want to add one of the things that I'm excited about uh, with my background coming out of the computer industry is uh, uh, they're already starting to talk about new capabilities, new capabilities that are going to be introduced through the software, upgrades that will be available. The Cortex automatically updates its own software uh, when connected to Wi-Fi. So uh, uh, there's all kinds of things like, for example, uh, I'm looking forward to when they put the replay capability where it listens to the last 30 seconds of a transmission and you know when you can't hear it or it's a weather and you could hit a button and have that replay and I'm hoping they'll do that as well as some other capabilities. So I'm excited to see and, and they Vesper has actually encouraged us, not just us on this uh, uh, on the Wagner guide, but uh, any, all of their users to start sending them ideas of what they could do. And they could implement that in, in software and the unit will just get better and better and better with more capabilities as we come up with, with different ideas. Somebody in New Zealand is probably cringing while I say that, but, but uh, no, you guys uh, uh, at Vesper have just done a terrific job and, and keep it up pass it on to the rest of the crew there. We're really excited about it. And I just wanted to second the vote for a record facility and that the, the device should always be recording the last 30 seconds or a minute uh, and uh, so that you can capture it, hit the button and say, oops, save that. I want to hear that. Or, and also another button that says, throw it away for the guy that's doing the big wake scold over <laughs> VHF radio and you can <laughs> delete that. Get out of there. Just, you know, seriously about the recording would be great, and especially for uh, VHF weather broadcasts so that you can go back, play it back again and say, was that 14 or 40 knots that they said? Uh, so that would be great. Terrific. Well, I think that uh, just about wraps us up to uh, eight o'clock. Uh, Peter, you always have such wonderful words of wisdom. Oh, uh, and, and nice first you. questions. The yeah. question I have for you is, You've quizzed me normally on which episode was Saturday Night Live. How many years has Saturday Night Live been running? Oh, I want to say 45. I think it's 43. I, I looked it up and I okay. unfortunately didn't write it oh, down. So you don't even know the answer to your trivia question you're trying to stump me on. I That's know, good. I know. That's I'm going to have to look it up now, but I'm pretty sure it's 43, but... Uh, I remember I, the first the first episode, phenomenal show, even way back then. Uh, I did have color TV though. I didn't have black. Yeah, I guess we'll have to stay tuned for next week's episode to see yeah. how many episodes. Uh, I, I had a little trivia for you. You know, have you voted yet, Mark? Have you got that ballot in the mail? You bet. You, you already bet. done. Yeah, science to deliver. I found some interesting stats on the voting in the United States when it comes to registrations. You know, in our state, we don't register. But there are one third of our country is registered Democrats, one third is registered as Republicans, and one third as Independents. And when pressed a little bit more, 49% of our country uh, identifies as Democrats and 44% as Republicans. Now, guess the percentage mark of registered voters that have high school or some college that have not graduated with an undergraduate degree. I, I honestly don't know. I didn't know either. Well, we have to watch Plus. next week. You have to watch next week. No, I was <laughs> two thirds of the country has a high school degree, a high school or some college. Twenty one percent have a bachelor's degree, and fifteen percent have a post doctorate, uh, post post doctorate degree. So that was interesting. Guess what percent? I'm not going to go on all night, but I've got a couple more. Guess what percentage identifies as Christian in our country, Mark? I, I don't know. Don't even want to. Don't even want to. 
you know, you get it wrong and the big man might come after you. Uh, 64% right. wow. identifies Christian, 36% is non-denominational, and the rest are unaffiliated, which could include Jewish people or Muslims. I thought that was interesting. Uh, the 69% of our country uh, identifies as non-Hispanic white, 11% black, 11% Hispanic, and 8% other, which is predominantly Asian. And so we're going to go. have an interesting show next week because it'll be after the election. Is that coming up? I missed that. Really? Is that around yeah, the corner? That's, what you oh, voted okay. for. that's why you checked with that's me. That's right. Are I'm you dressing up for Halloween, Mark? Uh, no, I, I, I uh, taking the night I, off. I, I will be wearing a mask, though. Yes, putting the razor blades <laughs> in the candy like you always do, Peter. Can I not say that it's after eight. Kids are a bit asleep. Candy at my at my house is safe. It's been safely checked. You know, that was a big urban legend. If you dig into that, there was never any sort of problems with poison candy. That uh, was just no, but it was tail. razor blades and apples. I think that... No, that never happened. It never happened. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. We've got a uh, National Oatmeal Day today. Was Mark uh, National Hermit Day and National Cat Day? And that's all I've got, really. Uh, I guess I got one more thing. Uh, Chris Christopherson was the host on episode 24, which was their last episode in season one of Staring Live. So this is our big kind of like cliffhanger tonight, and maybe we'll start season two next week. What's on tap next week? Did you say that already? Uh, we did say earlier, and now I forgot. Oh, we're going to talk a little bit about the Seattle Boat Show. Excellent. Uh, Excellent. The NTA will be announcing tomorrow I've got gear. I've got what my... the status of the boat show will be, whether oh. we'll be able to uh, come down to the CenturyLink field, uh, yeah. or whether we're going to be doing something different. Wow, wow, wow. Well, we'll have a so, uh, show. We're going to have our own Peter Schrappen and Katie McPhail talking to us about the boat show next week. Sounds and good. we'll do just a, some announcements on it. Separately, we're going to have a show to talk about the boat show format and uh, what, what uh, kind of a preview of what's going to be happening. Sweet. Lorena, what's on your mind? I think you have some uh, homes to show us tonight too, Mark, from Grossbeck. I don't have any to show, but thank you. We do want to recognize Gene Grosbeck and Associates as our sponsor. And uh, I did look up to see what they have, and they've got some lots that are available, uh, as well as a couple of homes. Uh, Gene put out a report this week that uh, just a tremendous number of homes are, are going up in value due to people wanting to leave uh, major cities like Portland and Seattle. And, uh, and they're looking for different uh, types of things in homes now. They're looking for a room that they can use to homeschool the kids. They're looking for more office space and multiple offices so that they can work from home. So, uh, you know, we're going through a whole demographic change here with, uh, with our COVID-19 world. So, uh, and for many of us, uh, we're just gonna go boating. And every Thursday night, you can count on us to be there for you. So we will see you next Thursday. Yes. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you for joining Good night. us. Good night. Good night. Good night.